can anybody get everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yes, uh, I'm James. I'm going to talk about make. I'm going to try and keep this really snappy because I've got like 80 slides and this is going to be terrifying. So uh, I will also preface this with like all of this is my opinion. It's not objective facts. These are just things that sort of irk me. Or they also like a bunch of people get a lot of use out of this stuff. So I don't want to. I don't want this to seem like I'm going. These tools are bad. They're just. I'm trying to like go like I have problems with them. Why is that? Okay. So. Um, my problem, what is my problem? So I have, uh, I have a JavaScript project. I have a bunch of things that I need to do with it. I need to compile my templates. I want to compile my CoffeeScript. I want to uh, bundle everything for production. I want to run tests. And I've decided to use uh, say grunt to do this, not to pick on grunt, but just for an example. And so say I'm using handlebars templates. Uh, I've already got a bit of a problem because uh, it's not a case of you write a grunt script that directly calls the handlebars module. You have to pick an adapter module, one of these plugins, that glues them together. And there's like multiple choices of those, so I'm already confused. And so I install them to have a bit of a uh, see what they look like. So I install uh, handlebars, which I'm using directly in my application, and I install a couple of these modules, and then I see that like, they have their own dependencies on handlebars that are not the same versions as the things that I'm using, so that's confusing. Um, I don't want this layer of indirection. I want my build tools to use what my app is actually depending on, not their own, uh, their own things that I can't get a handle on. And uh, everything I use needs one of these adapters to talk to all the different build tools. Um, so there's this sort of combinatoric explosion of uh, uh, things that glue all these, these various things together. So there's adapters for CoffeeScript, there's adapters for Uglify, and then you get into like things that glue like multiple things together. So a build tool and a test framework and a runner platform. You get like Jasmine Node Coffee. <laughs> like I'm sure these solve like these are, this is the sort of thing like if this is a framework and you just put a name on it, it goes that we've we've decided to build our project this way and we're going to call it this. Um, but I see like this explosion of like all these combinations of things. And when I see stuff like that in an ecosystem, it makes me think that those things weren't easy enough to just glue together naturally. They needed something to come along and implicitly make, uh, make them talk to each other for you, um, which is a, a bit of a design smell to me. Um, in the Node community, uh, you hear a lot in the Node community about Unix and the Unix way and uh, things being easily composable without needing a framework to do this work for you. Um, and so uh, when I was, um, I spent a lot of last year uh, writing this book. It's about JavaScript testing. Apparently, it's good, according it's to some great. people. OK, thank you. It's great. great. You should totally read it. Um, and uh, building a book is like a lot like the sort of stuff you do in a JavaScript project. You have to take some text files, turn them into some XML, turn that XML into three other kinds of XML, then turn one of those into a PDF, turn one of them into some other stuff. Um, it's this like making files out of files out of files. And um, I didn't know very much about Make at the time, but I thought I'd have a look at it. And it turns out, like, make is a language for saying how files are related to each other. And it is the most terse language you can invent for doing that. And it looks very cryptic to people who haven't seen make files before. But once you understand a few key ideas, it's very easy to pick up. So let's look at example application. This is actually adapted for an example in my book. So we have a lib directory. It's got a couple of files in it, a concept and a concept view. These are background things. And it's got a templates directory, which has a handlebars thing in it. And then it's got a vendor directory, which has jQuery in it. So uh, third party dependencies in there. So there's not a lot of code here. This is totally for demonstration purposes. We don't really care what this app does. It's just that it has CoffeeScript in it is the important thing. So we've got a, uh, a concept, which is a backbone model. It doesn't have any behavior. It's just a model. You can put attributes in it. We have a view that is going to uh, take um, uh, it's going to take one of these concepts as a model, and when it changes, it's going to re-render it. Standard sort of backbone uh, update when the model changes dance. And to render it, we're going to use um, our handlebars templates, which we've called concert. Uh, so handlebars compiles templates into functions that you can call. So uh, if we call t.concert with the model's attributes, then we get some HTML, and we shove that into the document. And the template itself uh, just takes attributes from the concert and renders them. So uh, this will give us a little uh, concert element. It'll tell us um, the artist and the, uh, the details of the venue where they're playing. Uh, we're also going to want some tests for this so we, uh, so we know, know that it works. 
So we're going to add our tests in the spec directory. We've got two new t uh, test files in here. And these do uh, pretty basic stuff. We've got a test for our template, uh, makes, uh, makes a concert object, and then it uh, makes some HTML by calling a concert function, and then it just checks that uh, it creates the right HTML structure using jQuery. And if we uh, test the view, again, it's a very similar thing. Um, it's just this time we need to inject some uh, HTML into the DOM so we can bootstrap the uh, backbone view on top of it, make a model object, make a view around that stuff, check that it displays the right stuff, and then check that if we uh, change details on the artist, then it updates what's, uh, what's shown in the document. So to get all this running, our application has some dependencies, right? It has some runtime dependencies. We know we're, we're using backbone, which means we're also using uh, underscore and jQuery and uh, we're using handlebars for templating. So to express our dependencies, we're going to make a package.json file. And it's going to say, OK, we need backbone and underscore. And our dev dependencies are uh, CoffeeScript, because we need to compile stuff, handlebars, because we need to compile our templates. And uh, I'm using uh, JS test to run tests, and uglify.js to uh, minify and bundle everything to run it in production. So run npm install on that, and we get a few executables in the node, uh, node module slash dot bin directory. Um, that's where NPM shoves all the executables for those programs we're going to use. And the nice thing about all these build tools we have in JavaScript is that most of them do have executables. You can call them in the shell. And that makes them really easy to use with Make. Make is all about generating files from other files with shell scripts. So Make basics. Make files consist almost entirely of things that look like this. Uh, the first bit is called the target. So what this says is, this is how to generate a.txt. Uh, so the, the target is the file that you're telling Make how to build. After the target, there's dependencies. So we're saying a.txt is generated from b.txt and c.txt. This is exactly the same as when you specify your dependencies in, um, in a node module. You're saying, which node modules do I directly depend on uh, in order to work? And then, uh, so what make does is, if you ask it to build a.txt, it will uh, first check that b.txt and c.txt are up to date. And if they're not up to date, it will run their recipes to update themselves. And, uh, and then it will come back here, and it will say, OK, well, if a.txt needs regenerating, so if, um, if, if b.txt or c.txt is newer, like its uh, last, modified file, um, last modified time on those files is newer than the one on a.txt, then it will run the script that tells how to, how to generate it. So in this case, we're just running, um, we're concatenating these two files and putting the result into the target. And those things are called the recipe. So we have target, dependencies, and recipe. Those are the three things that make up any, any make rule. There's one subtlety to this, which is that the recipe has to be prefixed with tabs, which some people find annoying, but it's pretty easy to set up your editor to that. Most editors let you specify tab behavior on a per file type basis. So first job, templates. We want to take our handlebars template and compile it into JavaScript so we can actually run it. So we've got our template down here. And we want to generate build.templates.js. So we want to turn a handlebars file into a JavaScript file. So to tell Make how to do that, first thing we're going to do is we're going to put the node programs on path so that we don't have to write node module slash bin slash program all the time. And we need to tell Make what shell we're using, because all of these are shell scripts, and Make needs, wants to know what shell it should execute those commands with. So we say that um, to, to make uh, build slash templates uh, JS, that depends on all the handlebars templates in our app. So it'll expand that wildcard there. Um, and uh, if it needs updating, then the way we do that is we make sure that the build directory exists, and then we run the handlebars program with our input files and pipe the output into the target. Uh, so we've introduced a make special variable here. Uh, there's a lot of sort of uh, um, special variables that are just a single character prefix with a dollar sign. Uh, this one, uh, dollar at, means the current target. So what I'm saying here, uh, dollar at refers to build slash templates.js. So uh, because you need to refer to the files you're working with a lot of the time, make has shorthands for that. And it also has functions for manipulating uh, strings and file names and all sorts of other stuff that you tend to do in these situations. So it has a dir function that just gives you the directory name of a file. So here, we had to make sure a directory exists first. We want to get the directory name of the target file and make sure that we can uh, create the parent directory before we try and write files there. 
May also has variables because this stuff gets quite, uh, um, so you can keep your, your recipes dry, right? So instead of reproducing the names of these files everywhere and duplicating them, we can put them in variables and then just use those variables throughout. So the way you uh, define a variable in make is you say variable name, uh, colon equals, or just equals, depending on which type of file expansion routine you want, but you don't need have to worry about that too often. Um, you just assign some variables, and then you can use them uh, the same way that you do in bash with a dollar sign in parentheses. So this, is, um, this shows, uh, makes laziness. So if you um, touch one of your templates, that updates its last modified time. If you then run make, make will just run whatever the first rule in your make file is by default if you don't give any, any arguments. It goes, OK, well, these templates were updated, so I need to run the recipe. And it shows you what it's doing. So it's making that directory. It's running handlebars. Then if you run it again, it goes, OK, well, templates.js is newer than all of the template files, so I don't need to do anything. And it just goes, oh, I don't need to do anything. And that saves you a few seconds. And as your project gets bigger, that can save you an awful lot of time. Next step, CoffeeScript. So we have our CoffeeScript files. We've got some in the lib directory and some in the t uh, spec directory. And we want to make, we want to turn those all into JavaScript. So we want to turn uh, concept.coffee into concept.js, the same for each of those files. But we'd rather not write a special rule for how to do each one of those files, because that's going to get very verbose. We actually want to have one rule that does all of them. And make lets you do that. Um, if you tell make to build a file, and it doesn't have a recipe for that specific fi file, it will try pattern match. And what this does, the percent thing, is a pattern matcher. So if you tell it to uh, build anything that matches that file, it will, um, uh, then it will, it, it will use this rule. So here we're saying, um, if we make uh, build slash lib slash concept.js, it goes, OK, I don't know how to build that, that exact file, but it pattern matches for this. And the percent matches the lib slash concept bit. So it knows that uh, this file depends on lib slash concept dot coffee. So it knows its dependencies, it checks whether they're up to date, and then it will re regenerate. And then uh, if, you, if it does need updating, you tell it how to update. So you just run the coffee compiler um, with the, uh, the target and the, um, the input file. This is another special variable. Um, I kind of have uh, mnemonics for these. So the at symbol is, means the current target. Uh, so that's sort of like in CoffeeScript, where at means this, or in Ruby, where it means self. Um, dollar left angle bracket means the first dependency. So I kind of think of that as like the thing on the left, right? The next task we have is minification. We've compiled our templates. We've comp compiled our CoffeeScript. We need to minify all our code for production. So we're going to use Uglify.js for this. So we've got our, our tree's getting pretty big now. We've got these uh, files that we've generated in the build directory. And we've got some, uh, some things that we are using from uh, node modules. And we've got jQuery down here. And we want to take all of those things and concatenate and minify them into this file app.js. So you'd be tempted at first to say, like, to write this sort of tersely, to say that app.js depends on uh, all the JS files in build lib and uh, build templates JS. But this is wrong because if these files, if none of these files exist yet, remember these are files that we're generating with another rule. So if those files don't exist yet, then this wildcard expands to an empty list and it will just go, uh, I don't need to update app.js because um, none of its dependencies actually, like it, it thinks it doesn't have any dependencies. What we actually need to do is we need to make this recipe know that before it can do this, it has to go and generate all the compiled coffee script. So this doesn't tell it how to do it. To make this work, we have to explicitly enumerate uh, the files that should be in this list. And this is a really common problem. Um, uh, so make has a solution to it. And the way that you do this is um, make has a function called wildcard, which will do a wildcard expansion on the file system of this path name. So if you run that, then the source files is now this list of all your CoffeeScript files. The next thing you do is, uh, this is a slightly cryptic syntax, but this says um, assign to build files. You take the list of source files, and you replace percent.coffee with build slash coffee.js. So that's the pattern matching rule that we used in our coffee recipe before. So that means you now have a list of all of the JavaScript files that are going to be generated by the CoffeeScript compilation process. And then you can use those 
uh, for dependencies in later things. So I've made a list there for my source files, and I've made a list for the uh, spec files, which we're going to use later. And then we just keep that pattern matching rule for how to compile CoffeeScript, because any time that it asks that make knows that it needs to update one of those generated files, it can just use that rule. We don't need to write one for each file. So then we can go on and generate our application bundle. So I've said app bundle is build slash app.js. That's the target that I want to write all this code to. Or a list of uh, files that I know I need from various libraries that I'm using. And then I can write a rule for that. So to generate that file, I depend on uh, all the, uh, the library files from here. I depend on all the build files that were generated by CoffeeScript. And I depend on the uh, templates. So when you make a recipe that depends on things that are generated by other recipes, make will go through and make sure that those are up to date first before running this thing. So you can just say make build slash app.js and it will generate all the prerequisites of that in the right order um, before running Uglify. Um, it's conventional in make to have a target called all, which is just run, if you run make all, that should just do whatever your project needs to get into a runnable state. Um, make also has this thing called phony. So usually in make you're dealing with file names, right? Because if you say make a file name, it'll go, it'll check whether it's up to date using last modified times. Um, but there are some make tasks that aren't file names, like make test or make clean. Um, and all is one of those things. Whenever you have a target that is not a file name, you need to tell make that that's not a file. And the way that you do that is by saying, uh, you put, make it a, de a dependency of the phony target. And that tells make, like, if you run make all, don't check for a file called all first, you just run the task. So you want to do that for running tests because you usually want to run the tests every time. Um, so that means if you make a file called test in your project, make won't skip running your tests altogether. So you've met another special variable here. Uh, dollar uh, carrot is... Um, just means all the dependencies. So like a uh, dollar left angle bracket was like the thing on the left, that just means like all the things up there. Um, so what if you're using Browserify to your dependencies? There I explicitly listed my dependencies, um, but uh, a lot of projects use Browserify. And uh, so say we have um, some files. I've got a file called pizza that depends on uh, dough, and dough depends on flour, and flour exports something. And you might think naively that uh, to write a rule for building your uh, project with Browserify, because the Browserify command is just Browserify the root file and then pipe that to a target, the only dependency is the root file, right? Well, that's wrong, because now make doesn't know about all the things in the, in the dependency tree for this. So if you change them, it doesn't know that it needs to regenerate the whole bundle. So what you'll see if you write that is that you'll, you'll, you'll run make, and it'll run the thing the first time. And if you t uh, update one of the dependent files, if you run make again, it won't do anything, because the only thing it's checking is the root of the tree. So the way you deal with this is Browserify has a command that lets you list all the modules that get uh, included uh, from a root file. So uh, if we run this in the shell, browserify dash dash list pizza.js, it will list all the things that pizza depends on, including itself. And we can use that in our recipe. So make has a function called shell that runs a shell command. Uh, so if you need to grab all the dependencies of your thing, um, you just run browserify.list and make that the dependencies of the, of the recipe. And then if you change any of those files in the tree, it will know that the uh, target needs updating. And indeed, we see that here. We run make the first time. It builds the thing for us. We update one of the dependencies. We run make again, and it still updates. And then the next time we run it, it knows, oh, I'm up to date now because you didn't change everything. So tests, final bit of the... Uh, uh, the process, how am I doing for time? It's got the clock. Oh, cool. So tests, um, you see a lot of these tests, things that like glue various test frameworks to different runners, different platforms. Um, the Unix philosophy goes, you ought to be able to do the, all, these, all these things on your own. So the first step is, um, I should just be able to make a web page that runs my tests, so I can run them wherever I want, in a browser, on a mobile device, wherever you happen to be. So. That's what I'm doing here. I make a web page. It includes my application bundle. So that's the, uh, the output of Uglify at the end of the build process. Um, we're including JS test, and we're including our spec files, and then starting off the tests. So this test process depends directly on the output of the build process and on the compiled spec uh, JavaScript files. Uh, JS test has a thing that lets you integrate with PhantomJS. So if you have a web page that runs your tests, you can just tell it to run that in PhantomJS, and it will print 
uh, output in the console for you. So this is a quick fact JS, JS script that loads JS test, uh, makes a headless reporter for it, and then tells the reporter to run the test page that we just made. Um, and so now you can use that in a recipe, right? So we know that our web page depends on the build output and on the compiled test files. So we make a recipe that says test depends on the build output and the compiled spec files from variables we created earlier. And then we say to run our tests, we use phantom.js with the script we just wrote. And this is the neat thing about make is that it's, you're not just confined to using JavaScript things. You can use executables from anywhere. Phantom.js is some like big binary blob of WebKit and Qt and all sorts of other things. Um, you can use anything that you can run in a shell. And it's also conventional for make uh, projects to have a task called clean that just d puts the, uh, the tree back in the state you got it from the git repo, so delete all the build artifacts. So because all our build artifacts are in the build directory, we can just delete that. And again, because these things aren't files, we have to tell them they're phony, so make won't check for a file called test before you, uh, before you run the stuff. So the first time that we, uh, we run our test, if we've just run make clean, and so we've not got any build, uh, build files, when we run make test, it's going to go through that whole process. It's going to compile the coffee script, it's going to compile the handlebars, um, it's going to uglify everything, and then it's going to compile the spec files, and then finally it's going to run the tests. But the next time you run it, none of that works necessary. All those files are up to date, and it just runs the tests for you. So that saves you a lot of time rebuilding stuff. But you might decide you don't even want to run your tests every time. If you know that they're up to date and nothing's changed, you might want to make that lazy. And we can do that by changing our recipe to look like this. So what we're doing here is telling make, firstly, that uh, this is a special target that makes uh, make delete a target uh, if there was an error during its recipe. Um, and we're going to say that there's a, a file. So the way you make this lazy is by making, making a file for what you're doing. And then make can check whether that file was up to date compared to everything else. So we're going to uh, save the results of a test into a file called spec slash results.xml. We're going to make our test task depend on that file. And then the way you generate that file is it depends on all the uh, various things being up to date. And uh, we run our phantom.js script again, but with the uh, format set to XML, and we pipe that into the target. So that's going to save an XML representation of the test run every time we run the tests. And what that means is that if you run make test and there was an error, so say the specs failed, make will pick up that there's an error, and then it will delete that file. So that means if the tests are bad, it doesn't save the results and let you not run the tests again. Uh, so then say I go in and fix the tests, I make a change to the file, I run make test again, it rebuilds the file that I changed, and it doesn't do anything else, it just does the work that it needs to. It runs the tests again, they're all good, and then I run make test a final time, and now it knows there's nothing to be done. So this can save you like, loads and loads and loads, loads of time. Like uh, Building my book takes a few minutes, so having like bits of that chopped out that I don't need to rerun is a huge time saver. So to... Uh, to round this out, there's a fundamental difference here between the way that you model builds with different tools, and it affects how you work. So the, um, the model of Grunt is that you have these various plugins. You have your handlebars plugin, your coffee plugin, your uglify plugin, whatever testing system you use. You import these plugins, and then you make a task that depends on all of them in sequence. So that you have a build task that knows you have to run handlebars, and then you have to run coffee, and then you have to run uglify, and then you have to run your tests. But there's nothing, this task doesn't know that you actually have to run these things before it. It's just in sequence in the dependencies of this thing. You can't just run the uglify build or just run the handlebars build because they don't know that they depend on one another. Whereas the model of make is that you actually make a tree of dependencies so that you can run any particular bit of that tree and it will make sure that it works properly. If I run my tests, it knows that I have to go and build my whole application and, that, and to do that you have to first run the handlebars and run the coffee script. Um, but it also means I can, I don't have to run test, I could just run the uglify bit, and it would do these things as a result. Or I could just run the handlebars bit, and if that had dependencies. So it means that you can um, do any sort of small bit of your project and make sure that it works properly. And that is a quick run through of uh, Make. If you have any questions, uh, this is the hashtag. I'll be next door in a bit. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Jim.